today for the uh, Almost Heaven 2023 uh, Star Party. We have uh, Dr. Cindy Crouch. Uh, Cindy is a retired veterinarian. She uh, she did her uh, her veterinary uh, doctoral work in uh, <clears throat> excuse me in University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, but she lives in Hawaii and she has to suffer through observing under Hawaiian sky. She just recently uh, did a As a retired veterinarian now, she just recently. Uh, she did a trip to South Africa where she was uh, uh, doing some um, endangered wildlife work. Uh, and since I've known her, she's traveled, I don't know, about Galagos. She was the creator of the Ast Astronomical League's uh, sketching observing program. Uh, in 2014 and has been the uh, coordinator and organizer of that for some years uh, ever since then and, and i remember last year i guess you, you had a, a cover drawing a lunar one of your lunar drawings was a cover of a sky and telescope so uh, what i'd like to do is kind of turn it over to you and, and let you just go ahead and jump in so cindy thank you so much for joining okay. us thank you thanks for having me um, yeah, I've got a, a presentation to deliver today and, <clears throat> excuse me, it has been pre-recorded. So that was just to make sure that all of my videos played well. Aloha, my name is Cindy Krosh and I'm a member of the Haleakala Amateur Astronomers. I'm also the Sketching Observing Program Coordinator for the Astronomical League. And this presentation is about sketching astronomical objects. I gave a recorded talk here last year, so I hope this is not redundant information. Uh, some of the information is the same, but I've added some new material, and I also hope to do some hands-on sketching. So I hope you brought along some supplies and are ready to have some fun. Some of you may be immediately thinking, forget it, I can't sketch. Well, hold that thought. A lot of people are put off by the thought of sketching, but astronomy sketching isn't for artists. It's for everyone, regardless of your level of observing experience or artistic ability. If you can make a pencil mark and smudge it with your finger, you can do this, and I will explain why you may want to. In fact, it's such an important skill for amateur astronomers that in 2014, the Astronomical League adopted a program dedicated to gaining experience doing so. If you've completed any of the Astronomical League programs, you may already know that some require sketching to complete the requirements. There are currently 73 observing programs, not including master series and other peripheral awards and challenges, and, and every year more are added. Uh, of these programs, 29 require sketching or sketching or imaging. This slide is just a picture of the program pages. It's not a picture of the programs that require sketching. Uh, to reach the upper award levels in the Master Observer Series, the Sketching Observing Program is now required for Silver Master Observer Award. And I just want to make something really clear. If you decide to do the Sketching Observing Program, no one is judging your sketches. You choose and sketch the required targets and fulfill the other requirements, like recording the uh, cardinal directions. It doesn't matter how bad you think your sketches are, Creating artistic sketches is not what the program is about. But first, a little history about astronomical sketching. Uh, documenting observations isn't anything new. Humans have recorded observations of the natural world for millennia, uh, trying to make sense of it. After the invention of the telescope in 1608, Sketching astronomical observations increased dramatically, and in 1610, Galileo rushed to publish his 32-page Starry Messenger. Uh, this book was filled with sketches of his observations made through a crude refracting telescope. Uh, though Galileo was not the first to suggest a heliocentric model, his observations of the moons of Jupiter gave further evidence that not everything orbits the Earth. And this annoyed the church, uh, who was already upset that Galileo showed sketches of an imperfect moon riddled with craters. Uh, the belief was that since God created the moon, it must be perfect. And here Galileo showed it was not. 
Uh, because his beliefs went against the church, the, the last eight years of his life were spent under house arrest. Um, and if you look at some of uh, these, these lunar sketches, they don't look completely accurate. It, it's speculated that that prominent crater that he drew uh, in his famous sketches is Albategnius, but it, it seems somewhat out of proportion. And some thoughts are that they that he may have exaggerated the crater to show lunar roughness and irregularity. But other things to consider are that his scope gave a, about a 20x magnification and only provided a quarter degree field of view. So he'd be sketching only a portion of the moon at one time. And, and this could throw off proportions. We really don't know what crater that is for sure. Uh, because formal naming of lunar, lunar craters didn't begin until 1651 with Riccioli and Grimaldi. Um, interesting fact, of nearly 1,600 named lunar craters, only 32 are named for women, and half of those are on the backside of the moon. Uh, John Herschel made very accurate deep sky sketches using an 18-inch speculum mirror. And he used a method of triangulation to sketch features, as well as calipers and grids to make precise measurements. The sketch shown here is his preliminary drawing of M8, the Lagoon Nebula. And this sketch took him months of observations to complete and shows remarkable detail and accuracy when compared to photographs of the same object today. This is just a picture of William's 20-foot scope, but John and his dad rebuilt it together, and John's scope would have looked similar to this. Now picture this, observing and sketching from a 20-foot focal-length scope. I mean, this platform would move up and down on this track, and you'd be sitting way up in the air most of the time. And sometimes it was really cold, even freezing, and try to sketch in that. And besides those hazards, you, you sure wouldn't want to drop your pencil. Astronomical sketching was not without inaccuracy and bias. Since the eye of no two observers is the same, the same object looked very different in the hands of different astronomers. This slide is from a talk Howard Bannock gave in 2015, showing six 19th century astronomers and their sketches of M1, the Crab Nebula. And I think you can appreciate there is plenty of variation of what each astronomer observed. I mean, they all have the same general shape, but you know, it kind of ends there. Um, some of the differences can be explained by remembering they had different educational backgrounds, equipment, location, eyesight, and skills in recording what they saw. But it's also important to note that observations were often used to support hypotheses which further influenced what was recorded. By the end of the 19th century, the age of astrophotography was in full swing, and the advent of deep sky imaging introduced further bias into sketching. Today, beautiful long exposure photographs influence what we expect to see when we look through our telescopes. The vast majority of astronomical discoveries over the past century are due in large part to astronomical imaging, but this in no way lessens the importance of scientific discoveries made by astronomer in earlier times using the tools they had at hand. Uh, these are just some examples of beautiful modern day amateur astronomy images from Haleakala amateur astronomy members. So you may ask if sketching isn't always accurate and we can take these awesome pictures, why sketch? While long exposure astrophotography may bring out the beauty and detail of an object, they don't show what is actually observed at the eyepiece. Have you ever looked at a gorgeous astrophotograph and then looked at the same object in a telescope and thought, oh, wow, well, that looks nothing like the picture. Um, that's the cool thing about sketches. You record what you see with your telescope and your conditions. Sketching requires only paper, a pencil, and a few other inexpensive items. In other words, it's cheap. Sketching provides a permanent record of your observations. Details that can be difficult to put into words can be illustrated on paper. A sketch can bring back vivid memories of an observation in a way written words may not. Uh, last year, Bob Bunge of the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club talked about his experience with a sketch of an 
astronomy event he did aboard a ship while he was in the Navy. When he looks at that sketch, everything comes back vividly, including the taste of the food that he ate that evening. You, you get a feeling of accomplishment when you sketch, and you might surprise yourself that over time, your ability to record what you see improves. Uh, in the sketching program for Astro League, it, it's something I hear consistently from people that begin sketching but had never done so before. And no, um, most people don't become artists, but the ability to record what you see will get better, and with it, better observing skills. There, there's a sense of personal connection to the universe when sketching at the eyepiece. It's really kind of meditative. And you know, you're out, you're absorbing the majesty of this beautiful night sky and, and you're experiencing a peaceful moment. Uh, when you sketch an object, you make it your own observation, unlike anyone else's. I know when I'm out sketching, um, I lose all track of time. And maybe most importantly, rather than flying through an evening of observing, spending a few minutes on each object, uh, sketching does take time. And it requires you to slow down long enough to record what's being viewed. As a result, you'll develop improved observing skills and see finer details. Um, one of the astrophotography members of my astronomy club used to kind of look down on sketching. And after he completed the sketching program, he told me it really changed his perception of sketching. Uh, he also decided to sketch all the objects for the Herschel 2 program, which was not required. And this was a guy that didn't really think there was any great value in sketching at the eyepiece until after he did it. We know the longer you look at something, the more details you'll see. And, and if you look at this grass, you might just say, so what, it's grass. But if you really look closely, you'll notice different tones and textures, light and dark areas. But so what about grass? This also applies to objects you observe and sketch in the night sky. When you sketch, you have to slow down and really look. It takes time and more conscious effort but over time it pays off. The more time you take, the more you'll see. So let's pretend we're out for an evening of observing. We have our scope set up and we have a whole list of objects we wanna to get to. We have go to, so it's gonna make it really easy. Uh, let's just look at a few objects. We're gonna go faster than at the scope, but this is just an approximation. So our first target for the night is the Stargate Asterism in Corvus. The beautiful beehive cluster in Cancer. Ooh, the needle galaxy in Coma Berenices. Yep, we're going all over the place. Globular cluster M15 in Hercules. And don't you just love when you look through the scope and the sky is labeled with the objects you're observing? I mean, that is just so convenient. The Num Dumbbell Nebula M27 in Volpecula. And let's swing over to the moon, Aristoteles and Eudoxus Crater. And yeah, wow, we're getting all over the place tonight. On a typical night, you're probably looking at even more objects, right? So what do you remember about each object you just observed? Possibly not very much. But once you sketch an object, you are much more likely to remember it, as well as finer details like the star field, density of a nebula, crater rims. There is an amazing brain link between drawing and memory that's been studied. The recent study from 2018 shows even when people weren't good at it, it still evoked a stronger memory than just written or visual recording. During this sketching talk last year, Dan Ward of the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club talked about his experience being an astrophotographer and that his AP images don't evoke the memories that his sketches do. Uh, and I've never imaged before, so I, I found this information very interesting. Thanks, Dan. So let's talk a little bit more about what you need to sketch before we try a few objects together. All you really need is a pencil, some paper, and an eraser. 
yes, a, an eraser, a big one, because we are going to make a lot of mistakes. And this is just a list uh, for a supply kit um, that has more stuff. And I'll go into a little detail about uh, each one of these things in the next few slides. Uh, the one thing I didn't list is a comfortable observing chair. That is very important when you sketch. For paper, I like templates with an area to write about the observation and record other details like conditions, what's going around, on around you, uh, et cetera. Uh, and you can also make sketches on plain printer paper or notebook. If you're not using a template, the sketch just needs to be large enough to show the smallest details you observed. And you may want to try some black paper with white implements. Some people actually prefer it for their observations. I personally like this method for doing lunar sketches because it just seems a more natural presentation to me. Uh, when you work with white paper, you're actually sketching the inverse of what you see. So stars and bright areas are dark on the page. But with black paper, you record it as it is. And I like that sometimes. My brain does not have to work as hard. An oversized or regular clipboard uh, with a Velcroed pencil is really useful. I misplaced and sat on many pencils in the dark before doing this. You can also get clipboards with storage space that hold your paper, and, and some even have pencil holders. Uh, red light is necessary to see your paper, but it should be dim enough to help preserve your night vision. And a rubber band to help keep your paper from blowing when the winds are up. Um, you can get a set of graphite pencils pretty inexpensively, Amazon or Art Supply Store, uh, but you don't really need them. You, you should have some that are going to be your softest or darkest uh, pencils, which are going to be like an 8 or 6B, uh, to the hardest pencils, which would be like a 6 to 9H. Um, but you can also just do everything with an HB or 2B pencil. Uh, their uh, graphite pencils are really easy to sharpen with a sharpener, but this is not so with charcoal pencils. Uh, the tips just break off. So for charcoal, it's best to use a razor to whittle down the charcoal core uh, and then use an emery board or sandpaper to get it to a point. I, I also like these General's Carbon Sketch pencils because they make really dark marks. I keep a small chunk of charcoal for objects like galaxies, nebulosity, and globular clusters. Uh, I scrape it on paper to make a little bit of powder to use. And I like old-fashioned pencil and erasers because they have an edge. Uh, I also like erasers in a dispensing pencil like the one on the far right, and they're both great for fine detail. The kneaded gummy erasers can be made into any shape, and they're really great de-stressors, and they're just you know fun to play with. Uh, for blending, you can use your finger, cotton swab, cloth, uh, soft cloth, blending tortillon, which is just a tightly rolled piece of paper that comes to a point and is available at art supply stores. They're pretty cheap. Uh, you can also use a soft bristle brush to apply charcoal in a more controlled way. The brush shown here is just a cheap makeup brush. Uh, other brushes with points uh, can also be used. And this is just a picture of my box of goods. I like to keep separate compartments for the white and black pencils and charcoal erasers, all that stuff. Now that we know about supplies, um, let's look a little at techniques. Cardinal directions are important to orient the sketch, but also if you want to compare your sketch to a photographic image or another sketch, since you'll want to orient them in the same direction. Uh, and this can also be useful to confirm you've sketched the correct object later on. I, I've had the experience of being unsure I had the right object after a star hop. And after sketching, um, found that I hadn't located the what my object at all, but sketched something else um, very close by. So cardinal directions of north, south, east, and west while looking in the telescope are different than naked eye sky directions. Uh, the direction depends on what type of scope you're using and how many reflections there are. To locate cardinal directions, place your object in the center of your field of view and watch to see where the object leaves. If you're using tracking, turn it off temporarily. The place the object drifts out 
is west. Mark this on your paper. Now you need to determine the other directions. North will be either clockwise or counterclockwise to the west direction you marked on your paper. Uh, this information is also on the Sketching Observing Program webpage. Uh, the other simple way to locate north is to first find west and then nudge your scope towards Polaris. And where the stars enter the field of view will be north. I then spend some time observing the object before starting the sketch, and, and here I'm just showing a fictitious eyepiece view on the left and my red light illuminated sketch pad on the right. Uh, one downside to sketching is that you will lose some of your dark adaption, even when using a, a red light. So having a general idea of the object and grabbing as much detail as possible before you begin is helpful. And while looking in the eyepiece, you can imagine a grid or a clock face lying over the field corresponding to your cardinal directions. And this is going to help you orient the sketch. Uh, you want to think about things like what stars are in each quadrant? Uh, where are the light and dark areas of an object? How concentrated a cluster is and uh, brightest stars and, and star patterns? Our eyes are very good at picking out patterns. Lightly sketch the positions of the brighter and then the fainter stars and object. You can go back and darken everything later when you're satisfied with the placement. Uh, go back to the main object and spend more time picking out further details like fainter stars, deepening a core, or adding nebulosity. And be sure to record the time, conditions, and what the object is. I, I was once so immersed in a sketch that I completely forgot to record what it was. So I recommend you do this first. And as I mentioned before, it's also nice to record what's going on around you, the people you observed with, the sounds, things that you were thinking about. When I go back to read uh, an observation and look at the sketches, I, I feel like I'm transported in time reliving the event. Uh, one evening I, I was out observing and I, I heard growling in stereo and I was out in this really remote area where there was nothing around for at least a mile. And I looked down to see one chihuahua on either side of me and thankfully they were little sweethearts and they just came to check me out. But that certainly was memorable and it helped me remember what I was sketching um, and everything about the evening pretty well. A lot of times I am thrilled with the details I record while I'm observing and sketching. And then I take the sketch indoors and I think, oh my gosh, that is such a mess. So after your evening is finished, you may want to remove any stray marks, smudges, fix star tails. Uh, but I don't recommend adding more details you didn't see at the scope, even though it's tempting. And it is interesting to see what you may have missed, but it's your observation, so don't change it. For pencil on white sketches, you can also invert to a more realistic view. Uh, with white paper, you can take a photo or scan them and use software, uh, photo software editing to invert from white to black. Uh, there are many resources available, and these are just a couple. Photoscape for PC is what I've always used, and it's, um, it's very easy in my hands. So let's go back to those objects we flew through early and sketch them. So if you brought your sketching stuff, bring it out now. Um, if possible, turn down the lights in the room so the paper is just illuminated by your red light. But if not, no worries. Just you know, We're just going to practice here. And so we're going to start the sketch, all of our sketches, by determining our cardinal direction, and we're going to record all that important information. Uh, but uh, to simplify for the next few slides, uh, we're just going to pretend that we've done all that. We're going to just concentrate on technique. If we look at the entire field here, um, do you see any patterns? Yeah, you know, you probably can definitely see that nice triangular pattern of stars there and some other triangular patterns of stars. So put those on your paper first and record the details about color, nebulosity, all that stuff. Um, and then go ahead and put in your fainter stars. And you can show fainter stars by using less pressure on your pencil or uh, by using a harder pencil, which will be a lighter mark. 
Now let's look at the second object, the beehive cluster. Oh, ready to run away, right? Um, but don't get overwhelmed. You don't need to record every star. That's the one thing that can make sketching at the eyepiece feel overwhelming is all those stars. So start by recording the most prominent or the ones that have specific patterns that help define the field, and then go back and add the fainter stars. So here I was looking at that triangular shaped uh, area, and I'm putting those stars in first, the brighter and the fainter, and then the peripheral flanking stars, which kind of make this look almost like a little butterfly. Um, a couple of double stars that I'm seeing, I'm going to put those and then I am going to go and see that kind of star tailish thing, which I'm going to record, but I'm going to record it looking at the other stars that I've already recorded so that I'm placing them in the right area. And again, thinking about that grid and where they're at. So I hope that you're recording things on your own page and I hope I'm not going to be going too fast here. And again, just going back, lesser magnitude stars. Um, I may also take that blending tortle on and just smudge some of the stars to just give them a little bit softer appearance. Um, sometimes the pencil marks can look really harsh on paper. Okay. We're going to move on to the needle galaxy. And we're going to start by putting the galaxy in first. Um, and you can use a Q-tip or your finger, uh, a thin brush works. Here I'm going to use that tortillon. You can even use the side of your pencil. Um, but I'm going to use that tortillon to get some uh, smoother areas in and be able to um, make the center or the core darker. I'm using my fingers to just kind of smudge things and, of course, an eraser because I do make a lot of mistakes. And I'm going to go back and add um, some more charcoal to the core, which remembering you're working uh, inversely. So everything you see in the eyepiece, which is really bright, is going to be really dark on your sketch. And I'm just kind of tapering the ends there. I'm going to take an eraser and I'm going to put in that dark lane. And that's where one of those really fine point erasers is very nice to have. And again, just tapering the edges. And if I, I'm going to go ahead and put in that peripheral fainter galaxy. And I do like the tortillon because it makes kind of a smudgy and not a harsh line. And then some field stars. And that's it. Look at that. Okay, so let, let's try our hand at a globular cluster. And this is where that small round brush, I think, really shines. Um, and I'm going to use some charcoal that I laid down on sandpaper. Uh, you can use your fingers or soft cloth as well, but fingers sometimes make the globular cluster look like fingerprints. Uh, so I'm just adding some charcoal to the, to the, to the core here and I'll go back in and add a little bit more. And what you can't see because it's out of the field of view, sorry, is I am just rubbing that brush on there to get off a lot of the excess uh, charcoal. And then I'm gonna smudge over the whole top of it again to just bring out um, the edges of the cluster. And I'm adding some of my, my uh, star field stars. And if I have a very resolved cluster, I might do kind of a woodpeckering random technique over the surface. But I always kind of go over that with my finger and smudge it out a little bit to give it a more realistic view. And... 
if I make a mistake, I'm going to just erase it. And then you get this big white spot, which is actually easy to get rid of. You just blend over it with your finger or you can take the brush and go back over it again. But you can you can usually blend that out pretty, pretty easily. And a lot of um, globular clusters have kind of this mottled looking cheesy appearance. So I'll take a kneaded eraser and bring it to a point and then just remove a little bit of the charcoal that I've laid down and then smudge over it and just gives it a little bit more realistic appearance depending on what the, the cluster looks like. Okay, so we can uh, give our hand to the Dumbbell Nebula now, and this is actually a sketch of the Dumbbell Nebula. We're gonna sketch from a sketch here. So um, you're gonna start with, again, uh, you can either just use your finger, but you can also use that brush. And in hindsight, I wish I would have made this more elliptical and not so circular. Uh, so that would be the outside of the entire nebula. And then I'm just taking the broadside of a pencil and I'm creating uh, the brightest area in the eyepiece, which is the nebulosity. And I can use differing pressures on the pencil to get the lighter and the darker areas, and then even go back over it and, um, and define it a little bit more. So I don't want to put too much pressure on it originally because I, I want to make sure that I'm happy with the shape, the overall shape. And here I'm using uh, the tortillon, and I like the tortillon again because it comes to a sharp point. I, I do like Q-tips, but I can't really uh, define a point with that. So uh, this is where I, I like this. And you don't have to do that at all. I mean, you can just use the side of your um, the side of your pencil and 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 do whatever shape that you want to do. Yeah, and I'm taking way more time than you probably need to do. But from here, I'm just going to put in some of the field stars that we have. And that's it. You're basically done with the Dumbbell Nebula. Okay, um, well, let's try our hand at Crater Aristoteles. And for simplicity's sake, we're not going to sketch Eudoxus and the surrounding area. And I love lunar sketching because you don't need to fight for your dark adaption. And as I've gotten older, my eyes have more and more trouble with low light for deep sky objects, but not with Luna. Um, I really enjoy when I'm doing lunar sketches. And this is going to just be a quick sketch to help you get the feel of it. But um, lunar sketching is really about seeing light and dark and the shades in between. Before we get started, let, let's talk about cardinal directions on the surface of the moon, which are recorded differently than for the sky. And when I was uh, uh, working as a veterinarian, one of my favorite animals uh, to work with was rabbits. So <laughs> I always see a rabbit in the moon. And this makes it easy for me to remember directions since ears are east and then nose points north and the Terminator runs north and south. So I determine my orientation either before or after I sketch. And I created a similar tutorial for a, a new book that's available from Astro League by John Ghost. It's called Carpe Lunum, and it's an excellent lunar resource. Um, sketching is just one of the many chapters. So everybody start by laying down some graphite lightly with your regular uh, number two pencil, and just don't press too hard because we're gonna wanna remove some of it for highlights. And another technique is actually to leave the highlighted areas white since some Sometimes it is harder to remove the graphite. Personally, I, I just find that more difficult, which is one reason that I prefer the black paper for lunar sketches, where I can layer white on black areas. But try it in different ways. There's, there's certainly no right or wrong uh, way to do it. And here we're just going to use a soft Kleenex or your fingers to just blend that area. And you want to just draw in the general outline of the crater as we see it. So I'm just, I'm drawing that elliptical shape that we're seeing here. And if you want to erase, you just, just go ahead and erase and then use your fingers to re-blend over the erasure. So there we have our, our general shape. 
Now, you know, really look at the crater and decide where are the darkest areas of shadow, where are the darkest areas. Uh, and we want to get those on paper right away since as you're sketching, um, they're going to continue to change. So put in their general outline and then fill them in. And I usually start with the side of the number two pencil. Uh, but I'll, I'll use something else to darken them later, or you can even use the number two pencil to darken them more. And you can also put in um, that dark area around Crater Mitchell as well. Um, any areas that are dark, you're going to want to put in. And I hope that you're doing this on your own paper right now just to kind of get the general feel for it. So I've done the, the shadowing in that crater wall, and then here's Crater Mitchell that I'm going to just put in uh, the darkest area of shadow to. And then the, the, the uh, crater uh, causes a shadow on the one end as well, so I'm just going to put that in, get that kind of down now. All right, uh, now you can put in the shape of that bright wall that you see. So I'm just adding another um, layer of pencil to show where that's at. And that's gonna end up being the lightest area of the sketch. Um, also the outer, the outer rim of the crater is also gonna catch most of the light. And you, you wanna think about you know, what direction the light is coming from. So, you know, that helps you to make sure your your light and darks are in the right areas. Okay. And if you're satisfied where everything's laid out, you know, stand back and look at it. And if you're, if you decide, yeah, that looks pretty good, then you can fill in more of the dark area of the shadows with a darker pencil. And I'm using a 9B pencil here, but if you don't have a darker pencil, you can always just lay down another layer of 2B pencil, um, your regular standard pencil. And we just want to really enhance the darkest areas here. That helps to make the, the crater pop a little bit more. Okay. And go back and I am leaving that spot um, that's catching light in the, in the uh, crater wall, so I did not go over that area. You can just kind of barely see it in the sketch. Okay. And if you have the, a tortillon, you know, blending stump Q-tip, this is, you wanna blend those dark shadows. Um, and here I, you know, again, I left that patch. I didn't go over that patch right there. Uh, at the top of the crater wall. So just, you know, use that to blend in. And like I said, you can use the Q-tip, but unfortunately the Q-tip doesn't give you that nice defined area um, as well as the tortillon, which has a nice uh, little point on the end. Okay, here we go. And um, I'm again using the darker pencil to put in those the floor peaks that we see. And um, I'm also going to put in a couple of smaller craters just to um, kind of keep in mind where they're located. You actually don't really have to do them here. You can do them in, an, in at a later time as well. Um, so then I just went back and I, I went and darkened some of the shadows as well. And I'm going to put in that little that little peripheral crater that's at the the edge of the rim as well, um, since that's pretty prominent, and that is something that um, helps define this this crater. 
And then again, I'm going to define that inner wall because um, my pencil marks kind of have disappeared here. It's kind of hard to see. I mean, they're there, but it's harder to see. So I'm putting in a little bit more structure to those walls as well. And again, I kind of did, kind of did this out of order. <laughs> my peaks and small craters normally go in last, but you know, like I said, there really isn't a right or wrong way. Uh, the one thing I will say is if you concentrate on small details right away, you sometimes get lost there. And then when you stand back and look at everything, it's something is out of proportion. So um, make sure that you're happy with the proportions and locations of what you're putting down before committing with the dark pencil. Okay. And I've decided here that my floor needs to be darker. So I kind of stood back and looked at the, <clears throat> the lunar um, crater and thought, yeah, you know what? Um, at my, uh, my wall was not going to really pop unless my crater uh, floor is darker. So I'm using the, um, the tortillon for that. And, and I do like using that because it, it, it looks more blended and it doesn't have pencil marks. So I can also use this to just help define uh, the wall a little bit better as well. Okay. Um, and this is really my favorite part and where I think the magic happens. Uh, when you erase to create light next to dark areas, uh, it will it will start to make the crater pop and appear very three-dimensional. Uh, the pencil end eraser has a nice point on it, and, and so does my other eraser, which I have sharpened with a razor blade. So, you know, just look to see where all the lightest areas are and remove the pencil there. And you can go in and adjust more later, which is what I normally end up doing. And I'm making the, the light areas around those peaks as well. And that also gives it a more three-dimensional view. And, you know, we now pretty much have our darkest darks, our lightest lights, which are the white paper, and mid-tone areas. And we're, we're almost done. I, I want to represent the outer outside of the crater as rough. So I'm just using the side of the pencil to create really coarse marks. Uh, and I'm going to do that in the directions that I see the striations coming off of the moon, um, the, which are light and dark. So um, I'm just kind of roughly putting that in. Nothing to find. You don't have to like um, try to get every little nook and cranny in there uh, unless you you want to spend some extra time doing that but like I said this is just going to be a short sketch we're just going to get the general roughness and the outline that that goes around this crater okay and um, I'm going to add some last uh, details around the crater now. And um, so I'm just going to do the roughness of the floor and some of the shadows that I'm seeing around the crater, uh, as well as um, just putting in some few darker areas and a couple of peripheral uh, smaller craters that I'm seeing. And just kind of shadowing around them and shadow, making a little bit more shadow around the outside of the of the crater there. Okay. <clears throat> and you know, standing back and looking at everything again, I'm decided I don't like the crater floor. It's not doesn't seem to be dark enough. It's not giving me enough pop. So I went back in with the tortillon and just defined it a little bit more. And then I'm going to take that eraser because that lit wall just, in my opinion, was not bright enough. So I'm, I'm just erasing a little bit more. And um, we're going to call this done. Uh, although you could spend an entire evening combing out all the details if you wanted to. This didn't take very long, and we have a pretty decent representation of what we observed at the eyepiece. 
And you might even recognize this crater when you see it again after spending this much time putting everything into place. So after sketching these few objects that we just did, I, I hope you feel more confident that you can do it and also appreciate that the longer observation does help you see more details rather than just hopping from one object to the next. And say you start to really enjoy sketching and you think, okay, how do I get better? Well, sketching comes easier to some people than others, but guaranteed, the more you do it, the easier it gets. It's that first commitment to just do it that's so difficult. Don't be afraid that it's not perfect. I think some people resist because they don't want to fail. And other people may feel it's a waste of time because you can image or just visually observe. And I hope I've convinced you that it is a rewarding endeavor and that if you've never done it before, it's not that difficult. At least I hope you'll give it a try. And remember, one of the main reasons to sketch is to gain improved observing skills, not to become an artist. Um, you can get together with your astro friends for a sketch star party, and you'll learn a lot from each other this way. And the moon is a great object to do this with. I learned a lot from others in sketching forums. Uh, just seeing what techniques someone else is using and what kinds of paper, uh, pencils, it was a, was a huge boost. And that and the encouragement of the sketching community. Cloudy Nights has a really active and friendly forum, so check that out. Astro League sketching resource page is full of videos and links, so definitely go there and check that out. Um, and if you start to feel good about what you're doing, Astro League has a yearly sketching contest, which is open to all members of AL. Uh, do not be afraid to enter. And above all else, remember, it's not a work of art. It's your observation. So get out there and do it and have fun with it. Thank you for listening, and I can take any questions. Covered this in the intro, but but you you said earlier that uh, you have no formal training in this. You kind of picked it up along the way. Yeah, yeah, and you know I I've always enjoyed doing some art. So while I was a veterinarian, I I would do watercolor paintings of animals. That was kind of my thing. And then once I got into astronomy, it was like I didn't want to do anything else except what I was seeing through the eyepiece. And my first sketches were, I mean, they were they were pen on lined paper. They were just scribbles and I have pages and pages of that. And I joined an astronomy forum and I went, actually it was astronomy forum, um, which was active then and I, it isn't anymore, but um, I thought, wow, people are really doing some, some really detailed work. And I thought I can get better at that. So that's, that's when that happened. I thought I'm gonna start focusing on trying to be better. Hey, Cindy, can you stop the share? Just so this Yeah. Yep, hang on one second. Stop. Ah, thank you. No, thank you. That was awesome. I loved how you added even the ones uh, from Bob and Dan in early on. Great references yeah. back to Novak. And I mean, I think it'll be really relatable. I know we've mm -hmm. heard Bob speak about that. So, and uh, adding Dan's feelings into his sketches is really cool. I know mm -hmm. he, I saw his chuckle on that, that brought a little twinkle in his eye. <laughs> so. Yeah, like yeah I I said, that, was, that was very interesting to me because I, I'm not an, um, an astrophotographer. And so I, I didn't realize that there was that, that, that link um, that strongly. So I didn't realize that people that did astrophotography didn't feel the same way. Let's put it that way. Cindy. Yes. Can you hear me okay? I can. Uh, question about moisture, dew. What do you do about dew? You know, um, if it's really, I, I don't have too much of a problem where I'm at at 4,000 elevation. So I don't um, really have to deal with that too much, but I have sketched inside of kind of a box before where I've made kind of a hood for the top of my sketch, my sketch pad if, if it is really um, moist outside. Okay, okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, and sometimes the papers do get kind of, you know, a little bit wavy and uh, the thinner okay. papers do especially. Yeah. 
I'm glad you asked that question because up at the Almost Heaven Star Party uh, last year when I tried to do some sketches, it was so humid there that I really had trouble with it and I hadn't thought about using a, a, a box as a hood. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're done, where do you put them? How do you store them? Well, I, I usually, since I sketch most of the time right next to my house, I take everything indoors immediately. But if I'm out in the field somewhere, um, I will usually just put them somewhere that's dry, like inside my car, you know, just find a place to put them. But they do make those um, those uh, sketch uh, boards that open up and you can store things in there. So okay. that's that's nice to have. Good. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I've had this one uh, about 35 years, I think. It's, it's falling apart, but it still works. Yeah. And does that keep everything really dry? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Yes, you're welcome. Okay. Well, I think I told you before, we, we typically have a fairly low live participation, but then once it's up on